This is Kevin Pruitt with Rising Tide Startups, and my guest today is Jacob Engel. Jacob, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate it, and congratulations on your new studio. <laughs> we were talking off camera. That's right. <laughs> right. Off, off, off recording, we got a brand new background here that we're right. we're going going to uh, to to just show the Rising Tide audience. So, and we'll right. get some feedback on the on the uh, on the background. But who right. is Jacob Engel? Okay, so. In my book, I tell the story. I'm going to do it very short. Yeah. And I'm the son of a Holocaust survivor. Mm. My dad, unfortunately, lost his dad in Auschwitz. He perished in Auschwitz. He came over from Eastern Europe after World War II without family, without money, without language, without any idea what he was going to do. Wow. But his resiliency and his determination and the need, necessity is the mother of all inventions. Absolutely. Brought out the best of him. Uh, he started from, he came from a very, very above middle class family. So, mm -hmm. but he had to start from the bottom, started in a, in a push cart in the Lower East Side of New York, if people are familiar with that. Mm. And, started on the, on the bottom, worked for a small spy shop that I think is still around called Schoenfeld and Sons. And the old man Schoenfeld said, Mr. Engel, you're way too smart to work <laughs> for a, you know, for a little push cart down here in the Lower East Side, Manhattan in New York. Why don't you go to Brooklyn? Brooklyn like was like, you know, the West Coast today, you know, cross country. <laughs> I want you to start your own shop. And he was incredibly successful, incredibly successful. He, he had gifts, I mean, unabil uh, un unbelievable abilities. Mm -hmm. And I spent my life working with him I, right out of school. It was the school of hard knocks. It was, that was my MBA, my PhD, whatever Absolutely, you want. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. We were in the spice business. I traveled the whole world over for spices. Fascinating to travel to third world countries. And, um, you know, I'm Orthodox, I'm Jewish, I'm Orthodox. I, I have to schlep my food. If the audience doesn't know what schlep means, I got to carry my food with me. It's Sabbath. I'm a Sabbath observer. Yeah. But it was fun. It was a lot of fun. Probably the most unique story is that I ended up in a in the island of Cochin off the Malabar coast in India, mm. which is the center of all the spice traders. And I went to visit one of our largest trading partners. And I see a, I see a sign says Jew town. And I said, Kishore, that was his name. I said, Kishore, why is it called Jew Town? And he looks at me with this in, in this Indian accent and says, because the Jews lived here. <laughs> and he tells me the history of wow. that Jew, Jews lived there for a thousand years. They were the, you know, the spice route, mm. spice route. So I was uh, for many years. Uh, unfortunately, my dad passed away relatively young. He was 65. And uh, the, the, fa the family businesses are, are still around. But over time, I elected, I was the chief operating officer, but I elected to eventually move out of the operating side of the business. I stayed on the real estate end of it, mm -hmm. got very much involved in real estate. But in 2008, when the financial markets took a huge hit, uh, people were losing their businesses, yeah. losing jobs. And I got involved with a significant uh, community initiative to help people find jobs and find businesses. And I, that sort of, that was the beginning of a re-career that I had never intended, right. never thought I would. And sort of the, the rest was history. So this was about 2009 that this started? Right. 2010 is when I started okay. my current company, which is a leadership and development company. I train, I do seminars. And mostly I, today I help companies really go from, well, I, I work with two types of companies. One is startups. Mm -hmm. I really ha have a passion for startups. And I tell them I, I like to take them from startup to grown up. <laughs> and the That's other a nice tagline. Are, yeah. And because I, we, were, we were in a high growth and every, every step of the way you've got to reinvent yourself. Right. And the other is our companies that entrepreneurs that run companies and then they plateaued or they, they get into all kinds of issues and usually I come in and it's a huge mess and I help companies figure out how uh, the entrepreneur how to build a real team real strategy not only shoot from the hip right and so those are the two main things that I've done and and, and my book is all about those different things so these are mainly these are not 
necessarily startups. These are these are mainly companies that have some maturity to them that might be transitioning to to the like the next growth level type thing. They, they tend to extra or something. Okay. Correct. So I'm gonna I'm gonna throw you a curve right here. I I am really curious about that picture behind your head. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I you know I was thinking when I was setting up my thing, should I not include? No, it? no, I absolutely. Yeah, I love the. Right. the so th this is a picture that somebody shared with me. This is a synagogue located in Eastern Europe that uh, if you can see the very close up of the picture, you can see the Nazis standing around the courtyard oh, wow. of that synagogue. And this was a synagogue that my grandfather, my great grandfather would uh, would go to to do the prayers, usually in, uh, during the holidays. And somebody gave me this picture, and it's such a stark picture of what happened during the invasion of the Germans into Eastern Europe. Now, specifically, what country? This this is in Ukraine, currently in Ukraine. Okay. In in the capital, or? No, it's about the the capital of Ukraine. I I'm not even sure. Kiev. Kiev. Yeah. No, this is not in the. This was originally Poland. Okay. And then re repurposed or right. redrawn. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. I I appreciate you I, unpacking that. I I'm just right. the depth of the story. I mean, I, I can just I can still see the and and sense the emotion as you're as you're sharing this. And I'm sure you shared this story many many times. And right. Uh, but but just the uh, just the difficulty. But but what a story of of kind of the phoenix rising out of the ashes and i mean right. i was i was watching a a video interview just before that you had done uh, with another podcast and and so so kind of walk us through the stages of this of this company that your father started that you got involved with i mean I, if i heard right i mean there were a lot of zeros involved oh yeah correct <laughs> so, yes good good zeros <laughs> yeah that's right. in a positive yes. direction that's right 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 so uh, the, the, the business sort of started out more in what we, uh, it, when, when it was moved to Brooklyn, it was just a spy shop. Mm -hmm. But then the sort of the lucky break, which was an unfortunate scenario, was the Korean War. Mm. Was, and somehow they got connected to the U.S. government that said, you know, we've got the GIs, uh, we need to send them food. Can you guys pack spices for us? And that was his sort of his lucky break. And years later, people would tell me, "Oh, I remember those green khaki cans. <laughs> you know, they used to pack them in these green cans, and they got them into the food service business. So they were very active in selling to restaurant, restaurant supplies, butter and eggs, and the business really grew. Eventually, we also got into retail. I'm skipping over, but we got sure. into retail. And the lucky break there was, you know, you always need a lucky break. But the lucky break was that Walmart had come onto the market and was looking for a spice supplier that can sell them direct. They wanted direct sourcing, manufacturing, mm -hmm. and not multiple hands in between because right. they knew exactly. every hand ends yeah. out of cost. And they wanted Absolutely. what was called triple net yeah. pricing. So we were direct sourcing. We did our own manufacturing, own packaging, own, own distribution. It was a perfect setup. It, and that propelled us into getting into major retailers. We then got into, we were also very active at nuts and dried fruits. So we set up another business, which is and still around and uh, it's been very, very successful. Uh, a third part of our business, we were doing real estate. We owned the buildings that we were in. Right. So that was a very fortunate move for us as well. And also had, had my tenants in areas of the buildings that were not occupied by your businesses and... Our strategy was we would take this huge building, we would occupy part, rent out part, and then right. as we grew, we would occupy the buildings. Today, we occupy many, many more buildings, yeah. but that was our strategy, and it worked. So in 2009, you you, you started working, what, in the in 1975. 70s? Okay, I was yeah. going to say mid-70s. So right. you were there for virtually 30 years, 35 years almost. I, I did take some time off. I went on to do some stuff on my own, also in the related business. I started a spice company in a kibbutz in Israel. Mm -hmm. But uh, on and off, I was there from 1975. And then uh, after my my father passed away, then I, we sort of unraveled the family. We were all together, all the family members. Right. And now part of the family owns 
one part of the business, part of the family owns the other business, and the real estate is a third part. But in 2010 was really when I started this whole new career mm -hmm. that I've been involved with. So let's 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 step into that that world just a little bit. So you you said that it was it was initially kind of set up as a nonprofit, where Correct. you were you were helping people kind of navigate the waters of the financial crisis and. Correct. Um, so. Did it did it then migrate to a for profit or is it still a not for profit or? Right. So I was doing uh, the community had asked me to meet and greet uh, with people that had lost their jobs, lost their businesses. Mm -hmm. I would and I was doing this on a, my own initiative. But what I realized was that a lot of people were just not finding jobs. Right. And when I sat down with them, I realized they were missing a significant amount of skills to reinvent themselves. So in those days, uh, commercial mortgages was the hot thing and then they all lost their their jobs. Yeah. But when I would meet with them, I realized that, oops, I should have taken off that ping. Um, I, I realized that they were, they didn't have transferable skills. They can only sell mortgages. Mm -hmm. They didn't understand anything else. So what I suggested for the T was, let's take a group of 15, and really help them build their identify their 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 strengths their abilities their skills their aptitudes and i sort of threw the book at them whatever i do whatever i've been trained in whatever methodologies i've accumulated over time and i said let's whatever we've got so for six months we spent we threw everything against them to you know sort of and and all of a sudden they they grew and they grew and all 15 either started businesses or found jobs. Wow. So, yeah. So I went back to the founders and they said, you know, guys, this works. Let's do this. on. Well, you know, we're focused on this. We don't do that. So I've got sort of a, a rule. If I suggest something and people don't want to do it, voila, I do it. So I started <laughs> my own for-profit uh -huh. training, leadership training, and I've trained hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. I was sort of disappointed that I'd meet people months or years thereafter and they'd say, oh, what were those things that you taught us? You know, mm. I forgot. Oh, I, yeah. I forgot it. I forgot. But the outcome was that many company, many people invited me into their companies Said, you know, you trained me so well and I became the CFO, COO, CEO, but my company needs training. So they brought me into their companies and I found that training companies – inside the company was a lot more stick you had stickability right right because it was it was actual it was um n now i'm sort of splitting my time between both where i do again outside training and i do inside training because interesting enough on my blog i just posted um the uh ceo of linkedin okay who said that in that the current skills skills gap is mostly what he calls soft skills. Right. And people are not trained and people, so I really focus on soft skills. Yeah, I mean, I, as you were describing, you know, your transition, I'm thinking that is, that's that's what, that's how I would describe it. I mean, the whole, the whole subset of what you were talking about is really soft skills, whether it's right. resume building, whether it's- Communication skills, you know, all the, all the things that would, that would lend itself to not right. only you know being able to get a job, but also keeping a job, and even maybe in a different industry. So, yeah, right. Trans transferable exactly. skills are all soft skills. Yeah, time management, communications, uh, the listening skill set, etc. Right. So, tell us about your book. You wrote you, and how did the book come? Did it just kind of grow out of the system that you had created, or? Right. So, when I was doing work for the community, somebody suggested I write articles uh, into the local newspaper. So. Um, I'm going to confess something here. I was a lousy student. <laughs> a lot of entrepreneurs were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the saving grace was I was a very avid reader. And I, and then I became a very avid reader of business books or self-improvement books. Yeah. I've read almost everything. I don't want to say everything, but almost everything. Yeah. So I had a lot of things percolating in my head. And somebody said, why don't you – And all right, there's a part of a story that I'll share with you. And uh, when when I was in, in the family business, I, I would read uh, HB uh, a lot of Harvard Business Review books. Right. 
because they'd extrapolate books in I didn't have the patience of reading 600, 700, 800 pages, but I'd like to read the extrapolation or the, mm -hmm. the shortcuts. And I came across this fascinating book written by an author. His name is Roy Camerano. And he identifies the struggles of the entrepreneurs. And I said, this guy got it. He understands it. It resonated. I tried to find him. I tried to look him up. This was pre-internet. Sure. No luck. Fast forward when I was doing this work with the community and I was throwing all everything I knew. I remembered, hey, this guy, Roy Camerano, but we had internet. So I did a search and lo and behold, something comes up, a phone number. And I call up and I said, and a woman picks up and says, yeah, can I speak to Roy? She says, oh, he'll be here tomorrow. I said, yeah, oh, sure. All right, can I leave him that a number? I left a number. Next day, I get a Long call. Long behold, he called back. Long behold, huh? he calls me back. I said, Roy, I've been looking at you for five years. <laughs> you know, He says, well, I was on a slow boat to Mexico. <laughs> but we connected. And I asked him to come in to do training. And we connected. And I asked him, uh, I, I read his book. And his book was really phenomenal, really understands entrepreneurs. And I took him on. I asked him to be my mentor. Hmm. And then one day, we went out to eat. And he said, you know, Jacob, you should really write a book. I said, me? Write a book? It was like the first thing for your mind. He says, yeah, really articulate. What is it that you – so I spent time writing the articles, writing the book. And then in my book, I tell the story that I met Michael Gerber of Emith yeah. and at a, at a health spa. And he was standing there, and he's got his traditional hat, you know, if, if you've ever seen Michael Gerber. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I look at him, and I say – and there's a sign, Michael Gerber. I said, are you the Michael Gerber? <laughs> he says, yeah, from Emith, yeah. I said, oh, can I talk to you? He said, sure, join my table. So we schmoozed, we talked. And then I said, you know, I've got a manuscript that I just written. Are you okay to read it and give me your input? And he looks at me and he says, you know, everybody that meets me wants me to read their book. Yep. But, you know, I, I like you. I like you. You're, you're a nice guy. <laughs> I said, I guess kindred spirit. So he read my book. Uh, I'm embarrassed to say he trashed it. Hmm. He said, that's not how you write a book. <laughs> and he really gave me the insight into what I should be writing. And he wanted me to really write a lot about my father. Hmm. And because he says that's motivated, that's inspiring, that's, that's resiliency, that shows a reinvention. Those are the things that people can really take away. So I... Honestly, I just couldn't throw away everything that I did. So I split. <laughs> so I split the book in, in parts. And if, if, if you, you know, the, so the first part is really about my dad. Yeah. And how, uh, and all the leadership lessons I've learned from him, his story, the leadership lessons, and there are a few takeaways, you know, for the audience, especially those that are successful entrepreneurs. The thing about my dad, even though the business was huge, I mean, really significant, we would do hundreds of millions of dollars. Mm. He didn't make the business his life. It did not. It wasn't all the encompassing thing. He was a community person. He was a family person. Uh, he loved to travel. He, uh, you know, it, unfortunately, I see too many entrepreneurs that the, the everything begins and ends with their business, yeah. and they don't have a life. Mm -hmm. And then if they have to retire, there's no well, life. The right. wife, they, yeah, yeah. There's, 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 they lost. Yeah. So. That that was one thing. And he was also very big on giving back to the community. Mm. I mean, people would come to him. He would he would help them. He, would, he started numerous businesses. He put up the money. He coached them. He guided them. And those were some of the things that I really wanted to take from him and perpetuate. So the book is it's more of a, of a legacy that I've learned from him and yeah. that I want to perpetuate. And, you know, there's this big thing today. Simon Sinek talks about the why. Right. Right. Yeah, and when people ask why? me, so why do you do what's mm -hmm. my why? And, and, and it's the real why is because when I lost my dad, uh, you know, he was my mentor. He was I mean, I, he, he was everything. But he he the legacy was so powerful that I had this um, I had this ambitious feeling and this passion to pass it on, to carry it further and to make sure that doesn't get lost. Mm -hmm. And, and that's why I'm very passionate. Why don't you honor him by telling us his name? His name was Barry Engel. Engel, obviously. Barry short uh, for anything? Well, uh, yeah, his Hebrew name was Yisachadov, which translates, Dov in Hebrew is 
a bear and um, Barry Bear, sort of. <laughs> but that was his name, Barry Engel. And the just an interesting anecdote that um, – Okay, I forgot. It'll come back to me. You asked me a question, and I got <laughs> I lost it for a moment. But I, yeah, so I'm I'm doing this to honor him, and that's the legacy that I like to share with people. I mean, but what a legacy to pass on! I mean, this this has a generational effect, a, a positive right. generational effect. So let's. Right. I was uh, like I said, I was watching a video before we did the interview. I, I I like to really try to do some good research on our on the guests that come on the show, oh. but. Um, so I, I saw this chart that that uh, had like Myers Briggs letters on Correct. it. So is that is that another thing that you incorporate into this? Is it kind of a holistic approach to, you know, finding out who you are and and you want to unpack that just a little bit about and maybe just talk a little bit about the process, you know, and maybe just kind of fifty thousand foot terms. Right. So you did do your homework. <laughs> I hope we always do the homework. <laughs> right. Um. Uh, so I got introduced to that it, when I was still in the family business. We had a consultant come in and explain to us that people have different approaches, different personalities, and therefore they work differently and they communicate right. differently. And it was sort of a like an aha moment for me. And I started to read up on it. And I came across this book, which uh, is one of my recommend on my recommended reading list on my in my website. It's uh, written by Dr. David Kersey called "Please Understand Me." And he takes Jung's theory, which was popularized by Myers-Briggs, and but he was a psychologist, and he also shares with how it works in the workplace. And it's it's fascinating. Now, the first chapter in my book is "Know Thyself," mm -hmm. meaning what are the strengths, what are the abilities, what because what I see oftentimes people sort of uh, they they put the round peg in the square hole type right. of syndrome. You really have to understand your strengths and your abilities and what what makes you, what energizes you. Mm -hmm. what, because the more you can figure out yourself, the more you know what you bring to the table, the more you can focus on it. Exactly. And Myers-Briggs is a personality test that focuses on your inborn, which really doesn't change much over a lifetime, mm -hmm. believe it or right. not. It, it, it may move to the center a bit, but it doesn't change. That, right. And yeah. you can elect to do certain things, but it doesn't change much over right. a lifetime. And that usually makes up about plus or minus about 50 percent of who we are. Mm -hmm. And the other 50 percent are, you know, culture, um, emotional intelligence, which is today right. a very big thing. But 50 percent is a huge part of us. And mm -hmm. we need to understand that what drives us. And, you know, there's the extroversion, which introversion it can go through the whole right. chart. But I encourage people to really test themselves, understand themselves. And all my clients use it as a as a team builder. You really don't want to use it as career, as a hiring tool, but you do want to use it as a team building tool. Oh, absolutely. How do we, right. How do we yeah. get together? How do we understand each other? And it's been very, very successful throughout the years. I know there are some people that knock it, mm -hmm. but I can tell you that I've, I've been working with a colleague who was a senior consultant at McKinsey, which is the largest consulting. Yeah. And they build their teams based upon Myers-Briggs. Well, it makes sense. I mean, you talked about kind of the, the combination of nature versus nurture. You Correct. Know, I mean, what's what I was was I born with and what have I accumulated over just life experience and interaction with others and things like that. But um, when my wife and I took our Myers-Briggs tests, probably... 15 years ago, and we found out we were exact opposites. And sometimes, I mean, all four letters were different. So yep. it's like when I speak to her, she hears like Charlie Brown's teacher. I mean, it's like, wah, 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 wah. You know, there's no, there's no, there's, it's illiterate, Definitely. you know, sometimes yep. to her. Right. It's really good. Right. So I, I will admit that my first aha moment in Please Understand Me was I showed it to my wife and I said, aha. <laughs> <laughs> Now we know the differences. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And it, I, we, I would never recommend you use that as an offensive tool, because <laughs> that's right. It will, it will come back to harm you. Correct. Uh, but right. it's like any tool. I mean, it's, it, it does have a limited usefulness if you use it as a crutch. 
and say, well, that's just the way I am. I, I can't do anything about it. Then you're not, you're not growing. You're not, you know, adapting to your circumstances. But, you know, in, in the emotional intelligence world, which is today huge and uh, highly uh, believe in the emotional intelligence part, uh, number one is self-awareness. Yeah. And, the, and, and self-awareness is by using different techniques and tools. Right. Well, I, I really appreciate you unpacking that. And, and uh, I know that sure. you've done a lot of, of coaching. You've done a lot of mentoring. Um, you've done a lot of leading yes. and training. So in, in all that time, what would you say would be maybe the top two obstacles or pain points that you've seen in, in maybe entrepreneurs as they get started? What, what are two things that you think these are, these are the obstacles that, that appear over and over and over again? Right. Um, so entrepreneurs are really most of my work right. is with entrepreneurs. And again, depending in entrepreneurs in their starting journey versus what I would call the next phase when they mm -hmm. try and build up to that next level, the beginning stages are quite tough, but there's a lot of passion, a lot of fire in the belly and a lot of willingness to learn and listen and to be coached. Find yourself a coach. Don't mm -hmm. do it on your own. Yeah. That's that's all I can say. Yeah. You know, find yourself a good coach, somebody who really understands, somebody who's been there, done that, uh, has, has taken a business up to the next level, has got the methodologies. It will make life so much easier. Yeah. And they do extremely well. Where I find the significant bumps are when companies are successful and they try and take that to the next level. Mm -hmm. And the entrepreneurs... I would say the two most significant challenges, and I just wrote I just wrote a whole article about this. Uh, number one, the importance of culture, meaning culture is created by the behaviors that you tolerate, and the entrepreneur doesn't realize they're creating a culture as they're building their company. Mm -hmm. And you've got to be it's got to be an intentional culture, culture, not an unintentional culture. Right. Don't let it happen on itself. Don't let it become a default culture. Be very intentional about what kind of culture you're creating in your business. And what are what are the things that what are the values that you stand for and what are the and what are the things you will not stand for? And be very true to those things. It's not easy, but those are the things I saw by my father. It was very clear what values he stood for and what values he would not stand for make that crystal clear and let people understand another thing which people today especially the millennials uh -huh. they want they really want to have a purpose they it's it they, they want to feel part of an impact so share with them what's the impact how are you what purpose what are you trying to accomplish what are the goals uh, share with them that vision so culture and and impact are two important steps that i find many entrepreneurs don't understand the importance of it because it sounds a little touchy feely mm -hmm. and most people don't recognize that those are things that motivate people excite people make the, and especially today's millennials if if they you know they will leave a job that might even pay more money absolutely if, if, if they don't have that feeling of purpose and uh, empowerment and encouragement and motivation right so usually important to create that culture of empowerment. The other somewhat similar type of issue is that oftentimes bosses, entrepreneurs really think that they need to make all the decisions, that they are the voice around the table. And what I encourage them to do is to be a voice around the table. Mm. Allow the input to your people. Let them share with. Let them be part of your decision-making process. Don't carry that the burden on your on your shoulders. Mm -hmm. uh, create a team that's able to think through. Because if eventually you want to sell that business, or if God forbid something happens, if it's only about you, that business has limited value. Yeah, I love that. If it's a, yeah, if it's if it's about a team, and you've empowered your team, uh, now there. I find is a very significant challenge because I'll tell you inevitably what the entrepreneur asks, and it's in my book, the question, so who am I? Hmm. What am I? If everybody can run my business, if, if people are making decisions, <laughs> they sort of feel diminished. Yeah. And there's a huge challenge of reinventing themselves and really creating something 
bigger and beyond. That's why I refer them back to the story of my dad of don't let the business be your only life. Mm. Give back to the community. That is so good. Yeah, yeah that, that is so good. I, I love the way that you've, you've kind of framed that. And, you know, you've heard our entrepreneurs, I don't work in your business, work on your business. And, Michael Gerber. You know, yeah. even building like the branding of the business is the branding about you or is the branding about the like you said, the values of the, of the business or the or the substance and, con and context of the business. And, you know, sure. can you pass this on? I mean, even even people that are starting companies like like you've started with the prosperous, prosperous leader, if you'd started that as the Jacob Ingalls Society, then it's a lot less likely to be passed on than, you know, just uh, uh, the company itself you know, right. can just be adapted by the, the new, the new, you know, organizational leadership structure, you know, as, right. as you need to pass that on. So as we, right. as we kind of transition from, from more of a 50,000 foot view and have, take a little deeper dive and, and get inside the emotional intelligence of, of Jacob Engel here. So right. you mentioned your dad, you mentioned others, but is there one? I'm just going to close. I'm just going to close my, uh, one of my programs is, is blinking and it's, be pink. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Is is there someone online today that that you really look up to that is that has been uh, someone that you follow pretty closely online that you know just one person and why? Right. So I would say the biggest influence that I had on my leadership training and my leadership skill sets that I still. I am a very firm believer, and it's very apparent in my book, is Dr. Stephen Covey okay. of The Seven Habits. Seven Habits, yeah. Yeah, I went out to the Covey Institute. I got trained in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. Well, they're actually in Provo, Utah. Mm -hmm. And I, I was fascinated by Stephen Covey's works. I've read all his books, listened to all his tapes, and I use a lot of his teachings, and, and I, it, it is still so relevant today. Mm -hmm. And his messages are very relevant. And... Uh, I would probably say that by far he's a person that uh, – and uh, before him, was the P Peter Drucker was probably the, the, the greatest uh, leadership right. – uh, Management guru. 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 Yeah. And I think a lot of it came uh, – but Stephen Covey was with somebody who put it into a great system. Mm -hmm. And where really you, you learn a lot from it. Uh, I follow a lot of people online. I follow Jack Welch. I follow almost anybody who is a leadership guru. Mm -hmm. I like to listen to you know many many different things. Seth Godin, Simon. Seth Sinek. Godin, yeah. Simon Simon Sinek is probably yeah. my my most famous uh, my most um, favorite Temporary author because right because I really like his insights. Yeah. Uh, the 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 why is a huge insight, and all my clients have to ask that answer that question. Mm -hmm. Why are you doing what you're doing? And somebody struggles. They struggle with it. Yeah, yeah, I, for you sure. Know, or, or what impact do you want to have? What is the outcome? And so, uh, Simon Sinek is also a great, great person. I follow a lot of people. I read a lot of books. Uh, there's, there's a lot of great stuff out there. And I encourage, I encourage everybody: read, read, read. Even if you are a miserable in school like I was, <laughs> read. <laughs> don't stop reading. People don't read today. Lifelong learner. You know, yeah, like, or at least listen to podcasts like these. Absolutely, that's right. Great interviews <laughs> like these. So, yeah, is well, there a? You know, people, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, people travel a lot, and they say it's tough for them to take long books, so they they download podcasts. That's right. That's good. That's good. That's right, yeah. and it's an increasing. I mean, it's a it's a exponentially increasing medium every year. So that right. so many people are are adapting it each year. But is yeah. there a a particular life quote that you? that you try to live by? Is there, is there like a one line life mantra or whatever that you would have? You might have it taped up on a wall somewhere on, on your computer or something that says, this is what, how I want to live. So that, that's a very, very good question. And probably what comes to mind is one of the 10 different quotes I have from my dad is uh, never confuse efforts for results. Mm -hmm. And really, you know, results counts and you've got to be result oriented. And uh, too many, too often times people confuse the two. Well, I tried, you know, I tried, I tried. But results, so never confuse efforts for results. Um, know what you stand for, what you won't stand for. Yeah. 
that goes back to what you're you're um, you're talking about the the inspiration and and even the pain points you talked you mentioned earlier is know your company values, know right. your know the you know what you stand for and make sure you're making that very clear to people working with you and, and right. for you. Right. Um, is there if you go back a few years and and kind of your your pre startup self, what's one piece of advice you would give yourself? that right now that you know now because you've been in this since 2010 that you wish you would have known at 2010 when you started this new this new phase of your of your journey okay that is a very very good question <laughs> <laughs> i i recently came across something which crystallized a lot of the challenges that entrepreneurs have and you did ask the question and i think this is another one uh, most people, myself included, have a significant fear of failure. Mm. The, and the four fatal fears, uh, you know, if somebody wants to read up on it, I also have it on, on, on my blog. Uh, there's fear of failure, fear of rejection, fear of uncomfortable emotions, and fear of being wrong. And fear of failure is really what holds us back. Right. Where we are concerned always, maybe we'll fail, maybe we'll fail. And obviously, you need to identify the risks, but let not fear hold you back because success is on the other side of the fear. Mm. And you've got to overcome, step out of that comfort zone. I can't tell you how much I had to step out of the comfort zone to get up and speak in front of public. I did, you know, I had to overcome that stage fright, I had to share with people, and the fear of failure was continuous. So, uh, and that's where coaches and really help. Right. Does that, I mean, as you were describing that, I almost thought of kind of the, like the imposter syndrome where, you know, you kind of have that, you know, I fake I'm it really, till you make it. Yeah. It's like, I don't even believe that I should be here. So how yeah. would my audience believe I should be here? You type thing. So. And, and again, that's why I think it's so important that it's a passion and a message and an impact that you want to have mm -hmm. that you're sharing with people. It's not so much that uh, I I deserve to be here. Right. Rather, I'm honored, I'm humbled to be here. Yeah, yeah, I, I love that. And I, and I mean, everything you've said tonight, I, I think that it resonates. You know, you kind of wrapped it up with that neat package at the end about, you know, we are humbled to be here. And it's a, it is an honor and a privilege to, to be able to share the experiences we've had because we were born into, you know, experiences and, and had things that have have been right. given to us and gifted to us, you know, through you know, right. different stages of life. And, and right. uh, I mean, just the whole package, the whole mosaic, you know, right. that the creator has given us to, to be able to unique. go and, and makes us, it, it, the way we were created was, was unique and the way our life has kind of un, unrolled is, is also unique. So right. I, I am so grateful for you to take the time to today and, and just unpack some of these things for us. And it's just been a, sure. a true pleasure to just engage with you and, and converse with you and, I mean, I could talk to you virtually all day long and just keep asking you questions, but I, I know you have other things to do and, and life to live, but is there Thank anything you. that we haven't touched on that you would like to just wrap up? And then I want to ask you how people can, can find you online. Great. So again, going back to your question, you know, what do entrepreneurs have to go through in order to, to achieve things? They've got to face their fears. Mm -hmm. uh, they need to identify their, their strengths and abilities, believe in themselves, be very passionate, hire a good coach that will help bring, extrapolate that, bring that out, or a mentor. And uh, not everybody is made for entrepreneurship. Uh, yeah, I would agree. Yeah. So you really have to be honest with yourself or have somebody be honest with you about that. Mm -hmm. But if you are, figure out what your strengths are. How do you bring that to the table? Why would people want to interact with you and create that impact that you can have? And then uh, you it. It will really enrich your life, enrich other people's lives. If people want to, uh, they can either go to my website, theprosperousleader.com. Okay, that will be in the show notes. Yeah, right. Uh, that would be probably the best. They can click on. They can click on my email. They can. There's a number there. There's uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn. I'm very active on LinkedIn, okay. and I've got a, a significant blog with a lot of good thought leadership. Right. Uh, hundreds of articles. So I've got some videos, as you've mentioned, and podcasts uh, Entire recently. Library. I, right. <laughs> Entire right. Library. And, and, and if you, you know, if you really read my book, there's a lot of insight yep. uh, 
Yeah. Well, we will certainly list that in the show notes as well. And uh, I, I've got to, I'm sorry, I, I had to chase a rabbit here. I've got to ask you one more question. So okay. as you're, as you're kind of, you, everything you're saying leads me to ask something else. So, so if, if we've got a listener that is, is trying to determine, you know, they're, they're working in their corporate job, but they're, they're just, it just doesn't resonate. They, they feel the kind of the drive to do something else. What would be the first step that you would give them in trying to determine how do you find what that one thing is? How do you, how do I find my why? How do I find my, you know, what I'm, what I was created to do? I mean, right. what, what is that? that initial process they need to go through. Right. So it's, you know, that's a significant question. I've get that question a lot and it would be a combination of things. What comes to mind is uh, Victor Frankl's quote of people detect their mission in life. They don't invent their li- mission in life. And there's a certain truth to it, but, but you gotta, you gotta spend the price. You, yeah. You've got to spend the time and the price. Experiment, and, test. Right. Try and I would out. say there's a lot, a lot of things you can do up front. Number one, I'm a big believer in the different testings. Mm-hmm. You can do an aptitude, attitude. Uh, there are so many great tools out there. Don't be afraid to use them. Don't right. be afraid to explore. Really understand yourself very well, your strengths and your abilities. And if you do have an entrepreneurial bent, it will come out. Mm-hmm. You need to have that passion. You need to have that fire. And you got to put the fear aside. That's why a coach is so important. But uh, being able to express yourself and have an impact and really figure out what impact can I have? Right. It, it should not be. I, I don't want to sound Pollyanna, but it should not be only about the money. Because Simon Sinek will tell you, if you listen to him, and I encourage everybody to listen to his mm-hmm. TED Talk, that so many people have failed because you need to have that drive, that mission, that, that vision to want to make an impact. And that is really what will drive your business. And just another quote to, that my dad used to say is, you know, everybody can sell a dollar for 99 cents. So it's okay. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah. It's okay to make money. I'm a big believer. I tell all my clients, uh, don't be, uh, you know, don't be foolish. You're, you're here to make money. Everybody wants to make money, but have a greater vision and a greater purpose as well. Um, uh, those are the things that really will uh, allow a person to you know, think about what they can have, what added value they can give, what great ideas they can come up with. And um, it's a journey. It but is it's, certainly a journey. Yeah, but it's uh, an exciting journey. And uh, don't be afraid to fail. Right. And I'm not afraid process. to fail. Yeah. Obviously. I mean, I, I, failed, I failed yesterday. I tried something. I failed yesterday. <laughs> It's part and parcel of learning. If yeah. you go in with, oh, it's okay to fail. and But that took a long time for me to master that the failure is temporary and it brings to new things, better things. It's okay to fail. They say oh, fail fast, right? That's right. I think fail fast and fail forward. But yeah, <laughs> fail, right. fail forward. Good. Yeah. Jacob, thank you so much for just taking the time to, to unpack this thank with you. us and just, just share with us. And uh, just thank you for playing your part. I mean, I, I see it just in your writing and the videos and the things that you do that you certainly right. play your part in helping all boats rise in a rising tide. Jacob, thanks right. again. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.